Good morning. Uh, good morning, conquest of doers, and good morning to extinction, distinction people. Today's the day of the Extinction Rebellion marches. Um, both my children are out on strike um, in support of Greta Thunbury um, and we won't be crossing any pick picket lines etc. Um, I did a video yesterday with my qualified support, my qualification being that uh, what we're striking about is um, the extinction distinction um, and the environmental crisis which I accept there's an environmental crisis um, scientifically I don't aver to the conjecture that there is a climate crisis um, based upon the CO2 conjecture regarding anthropogenic global warming so we're going to dive straight into part two here uh, and um, I will says I've got an unstable connection. Right, the connection might not be so great, but I'm recording this as I go, so I will upload a, a good stream later and, and keep going through the uh, disturbances that, that may or may not occur as we go along. So, George Perkins Marsh. Um, he, just to read what uh, Wikipedia says about him, uh, was an American diplomat and philologist um, is considered by some to be America's first environmentalist and by recognizing the irreversible impact of man's actions on the earth a precursor to the sustainability concept although conservationists would be more accurate the Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park in Vermont takes its name in part from Marsh his 1864 book Man and Nature had a great impact in many parts of the world and uh, George Perkins Marsh said this, Man has too long forgotten that the earth was given to him for usufruct, alone, not for consumption, still less for profligate waste. Now usufruct is uh, Latin and, and what it means is that um, uh, <coughs> the right to the fruits of uh, a fruit giving uh, process um, the fruits belong to the person, become their property, the mixture of labour with land, etc. Um, as opposed to usury, uh, which um, is the sort of the counter argument to use for up. Um, and uh, this is a, a concept which is very important uh, in terms of the monetary aspects of what drives the profligate waste uh, which reminds me um, I wanted to mention the excellent video series um, the story of stuff uh, check it out so moving on philology what is it it's the study of language in oral and written historical sources it is the intersection between textual criticism, literary criticism, history and linguistics. Now the word tags that I did in yesterday's talk are a form of textual analysis um, and uh, do look at this article and click on the links to what textual criticism, literary criticism, history and linguistics is all about. In the talk by Dr Glassman which I put up, um, not yesterday, but the day before. Um, he talks about pedantry and words and word definitions, etc. It's, um, it, it's very important to the semantics of science. So, in my talk yesterday, I mentioned uh, Quine's paper, uh, the, the, the Dogmas of... Uh, of empiricism <clears throat> and I wanted to read this part about the gods of Homer so uh, as an empiricist I continue to think of the conceptual scheme of science as a tool ultimately for predicting future experience in the light of past experience 
physical objects are conceptually imported into the situation as convenient intermediaries, not by definition in terms of experience, but simply as irreducible posits, comparable epistemologically to the gods of Homer. Let me interject that for my part I do, qua lay physicist, believe in physical objects and not in Homer's gods, and I consider it a scientific error to believe otherwise. But in point of epistemological footing, the physical objects and the gods differ only in degree and not in kind. Both sorts of entities enter our conception only as cultural posits. The myth of physical objects is epistemologically superior to most in that it has proved more efficacious than other myths as a device for working a manageable structure into the flux of experience. QED. And then what I've just wanted to do here, I, I mentioned uh, Epictetus, who's a Stoic philosopher, and his Enchiridion. This is the uh, Enchiridion, and I wanted to read uh, Clause 42. When any person harms you or speaks badly of you, remember that he acts or speaks from a supposition of its being his duty. Now it is not possible that he should follow what appears right to you, but what appears so to himself. Therefore, if he judges from a wrong appearance, he is the person hurt, since he too is the person deceived. For if anyone should suppose a true proposition to be false, the proposition is not hurt, but he who is deceived about it. Setting out then from these principles, you will merely bear a person who reviles you, for you will say upon every occasion, it seemed so to him. This tab uh, is kind of an obituary for Lyndon LaRouche, um, who died, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Um, the LaRouche uh, organisation um, do a lot of research, uh, and uh, this article is talking about some of the, what they said, are crackpot theories. Um, you know, one man's fish is another one's plus, and etc. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention in passing um, Webster Tar uh, Tarpley, who's an alumnus of uh, the La Roche organisation. He actually left, and he's a, a, a historian that has published a great volume of work, books, and YouTube uh, dialogues. Um, and uh, being aware of uh, the research and the discourses published on the LaRouche uh, YouTube channel um, and what they say about uh, anthropogenic climate, uh, climate change etc uh, should be entering into uh, challenging um, the hypotheses and the belief systems that you may or may not be building up around this idea of a climate crisis. Now, uh, Klaus Johnson is um, the most cited um, applied mathematician. He's a professor of mathematics at uh, the um, KIT, Stockholm Institute of Technology. And um, uh, on his website, uh, there are a number of books which you can look at go on, on Google Books. One of them is... Uh, uh, Dr. Faustus of Modern Physics, you see that here. Um, this is an interesting thing, a well-posedness of Navier-Stokes Euler Clay problem. Um, Klaus is a uh, pioneer of uh, finite element analysis and he solved the uh, problem of turbulent flow around, around the theory of flight. Um, and uh, Klaus is a critic of the global warming hypothesis, global warming modelling, and uh, cha challenges and brings out some of the mistakes in their application of different theories. Uh, one he particularly gets into is the uh, black box um, uh, radiation. 
um, and the Boltzmann equations. Uh, be that as it may, um, depend. You know, you can get as deeply into this stuff as you, uh, uh, as you sh so require. Uh, but what I wanted to do was just read uh, the end of the uh, introduction to um, the the book, um, the uh, Doctor Faustus of Modern um, Physics. The reader will find that the Faust legend describes the dilemma which confronted the fathers when they took on the role of saving science from collapse. To succeed, they had to pay the price of selling out their classical scientific souls. The price was to give up of the basic classical concepts of space and time and determinism and the basic classical principle of cause and effect. A very high price and according the fathers came to suffer much like Dr. Faustus did. But the responsibility is not only carried by the fathers, but all of us who confess to the religion of science in the postmodern world, coming out from the trauma of the modern world. In fact, the modernity of physics came together with modernity in the arts, cubism, atonal music, and in politics as the classical world of enlightenment collapsed into the, in, into the First World War and never really recovered from the Second. At the end, uh, a door is open to resolving some of the paradoxes without paying the price, uh, high price the fathers felt obliged to pay. And there's a photograph here of Einstein uh, in front of a critical sceptical jury at Oxford University defending his equations of general relativity. Um, so that's uh, something to go and have a look at. So this was the blog I did yesterday, Distinction Rebellion, Settled Seance and pseudo um, You've got an ology and you say you failed, you get an ology and you're a scientist. It's the famous uh, people of my generation, Maureen Lippmann um, advert for British Telecom. Um, that's the uh, thing there. I'm going to open these uh, windows as we go through uh, because I'll put the links into... Uh, the blog of this video and also um, a combined essay for yesterday's blog and, and this one. So, um, I, um, a couple of years ago, uh, produced this PDF <coughs> into which I put various um, uh, scientific um, arguments on, uh, well it says here, climate all angles, IPCC, alarmist, warmest, lukewarmest, sceptic, and above all dialogical. Um, and you can download that PDF, uh, which I've got open at this diagram here, uh, which shows how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and how much of it is actually produced from man-made emissions. Um, it's a trace gas, that's not controversial. And then this is a uh, sceptic website called I Love My Carbon Dioxide, which has um, a annotated um, thing of the same diagram. Uh, that's where that other diagram came from, and it's obviously been annotated since. So I did a, a blog at the beginning of this month, um, climate change uh, world heading for warmest decade says the Met Office. Now this appeared on the BBC and I was curious why the BBC in this graph um, had uh, five of the temperature records but excluded the uh, satellite record from University of Alabama Huntsville um, and uh, I uh, link to the data on the Roy Spencer website um, and you know, put a few of my comments in here, uh, which um, show here uh, the low forecast and the high forecast for temperature change based on current rates of increasing emissions, etc. Um, and uh, uh, that's there, you can read it and draw your own conclusions as to uh, what you think that means. Why did they exclude that record? Um, and then this is another blog, which is a dialogue I had with Pippa Bartoloti, an ex-leader of the Welsh Green Party. Pippa's a fantastic person. Um, and um, Pippa had linked to the big fuss at that time uh, about um, 
Exxon Mobil being taken to court um, in California, and I did some research. I read the court papers, etc., on this, and uh, this is what I said to Pippa. Pippa, there is no link to the Exxon scientist's hypothesis regarding CO2 and its contribution to a rise in temperatures globally. Back in the 1960s, most scientists were concerned with global cooling. The greenhouse effect and global warming forces from CO2 are two different questions. Uh, the link that you have given is wholly unsatisfactory. For those of us interested in the data and assumptions which the Exxon scientists are alleged to have made, I would like to review that evidence and then to comment further. I assume you have yourself seen the evidence and you can provide links to the evidence which you base your opinion on. Um, and we, we have a bit of a to and a fro and I go off and do my, my thing. Um, and uh, it, well, you can read it yourself, and you can see where uh, where do I come down on this? Um, so here we are. The case is mainly about sea level rises and pollution of tidal basins basins around a particular oil plant. The allegations regarding frustrating climate science, looking at the science cited in the very old in, in and the very old nature. Uh, the latest were circa 1990, others date back to the 1940s. Uh, the CO2 warming hypothesis has absolutely no credible science related to a substantiation of the AGW hypothesis of CO2 causing warming. Um, this is human emissions uh, additional, um, so this is the climate feedbacks point. Uh, climate feedbacks are not something which I would expect any court of law to objectively uphold. The case has not been made in the general scientific literature, and another case which I was reminded of tends to suggest a lack of empirical evidence. I am referring to Michael Mann's various lawsuits uh, for defamation against various unfortunate uh, journalists. Um, I read actually this morning that the um, case of Michael Mann against um, uh, Stain, Mark Stain, the Canadian journalist, uh, British Canadian journalist, uh, is actually going to the Supreme Court. And then I cite the Rockets Times Journal and various other stuff. Well, I'll put the link in the description. You can have a look at that dialogue yourself um, and see what you think is is in in all of that. So, so, right, that's the pipper, right? Then we come to. Um, Another thing that's come out of some reading I've been doing around this, this, this is an Australian um, website, the Galileo Movement. Uh, Joanne Nova is a journalist um, that's done various, uh, uh, I think, good journalism on, on these questions. Um, and then there's this, uh, this... Systems, the arrival of man and all that video. he wins. Uh, which the Galileo it's hard to comprehend. And, and this bit of Imagine the, the deck represents all the gases on Earth. If we were to travel along the bridge to somewhere around here, that would represent all the nitrogen in Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. So I'm going to just get through this presentation, otherwise it will be really long. The video, this video will be in the links, and uh, if you watch it, you'll see that uh, CO2 is a trace gas, which is not controversial. This is their um, daily Lee, which you, you can actually produce these papers yourself. I do two of them, one for general ge um, general political economy and one for called the Ethereum daily. Uh, I'm into crypto uh, currencies, more smart contracts and Web3 development, more of which later. Um, and then we come to yesterday's video. Distinction Rebellion, Greta Thunberg encouraging some scepticism. That's what that's called. Uh, then this is the Glassman talk and slides from 2009, uh, again, which um, lays out my terms of reference based on uh, Glassman's um, definition of, of, of what constitutes a scientific model and, and what components need to be in it. Um, and then that's that again. Now I also blog on a Web3 platform called Steamit, and Francis Leader um, has done this very good uh, uh, article from Occupy to Extinction Rebellion, exposing the common purpose. And if you look at the comments, there's interesting comments. Um, and then here's the 
blog that I've put up with various links and pictures and whatnot, which is the kind of a condensed thing of what's on my long haired musings blog. Um, and then this is the Barbara McKenzie site, which again has a look at the contrast between the uh, Dana Alabed and uh, the promotion of, of, of her message from Syria and contrasts it with um, uh, the corporate um, hijack of, or alleged corporate hijack of uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, message. Then there's uh, Greta's TED talk. Um, which I've asked both my children to watch and they're out on strike today in support of the strike. <coughs> the PDF I pointed out earlier, as I said, I produced that so that I could um, produce some sort of uh, objective scientific uh, questioning of, uh, or interrogation of that concept. Uh, and then I referred one of the questions on Francis's blog to, to, to this blog, which is called Science of Doom. And this question particularly, which is to do with um, model measurement and feedbacks um, and the uh, bandwidths at which CO2 um, absorbs uh, and becomes saturated with radiation, etc. And that, that is a core question uh, regarding um, the limits of CO2 as a greenhouse gas. Um, And, and that's just the second part of that article and the link will be in the description. So, um, this here is uh, Lord Monckton uh, has produced a paper um, uh, which has been published and which tackles four uh, errors. Um, Glassman in 2009 also uh, published an article uh, which he called The Fatal Errors in the IPCC Climate Models which we'll come to in a minute. And um, then that comes to uh, Lord Monckton. He's mentioned in two things on my blog. This, uh, this graph here is actually from the Bert Rodin uh, presentation on uh, uh, just what that is. I mean, the, the links will be there so you can look at these things. I'm not going to explain in depth these uh, different things. Uh, to get into this field, there is some reading to do and there's some understanding of some... Uh, mathematical concepts and the purpose of this we uh, uh, video is to talk about the fast Fourier transfer and a brief introduction if you will. Um, so anyway the beginning of this blog, uh, climate denial or climate science who polices the witch hunters, um, that's a reference back to the classical question about who oversees the E4s, the E4s were in Sparta and they were the person that oversaw the king and the question was well but who, who keeps an eye on them um, and this is a quote from Arthur Miller's Crucible a fire a fire is burning I hear the boot of Lucifer I see his filthy face and it is my face and your face down forth for them that quail to bring men out of ignorance as I have quailed and as you quail now when you know in all your black hearts that this be fraud God damns our kind especially, and we will burn, we will burn together, which is kind of apt in the, uh, in, in the current uh, context. Uh, so this is um, Lord Monckton's update um, on the startling area uh, of last July. Um, which goes into some of the aspects of it. This is the uh, summary of the technical aspects of the question. Um, that mass will probably look horrendously difficult for, for you um, if you're not familiar with this field of, uh, of uh, science and technology. But the link will be there if you want to spend some time with it having a look at it. Um, this is the full paper. Um, and the feedback amplification uh, issues here. Right, so, just to get back to what we're talking about with modeling chaotic dynamic systems, 
Um, this is a uh, catter who goes by the non de plume uh, slice jockey. Um, and she works in something called Pure Data, which is an object modeling, sound modeling uh, platform which grew out of the Max MSP platform. Um, and this is about windowing and overlapping of windows. Uh, these are uh, windows are uh, basically slices of a curve uh, and which part of the curve where, where you put your biases in uh, saying what will be dominant in what actually iterates out from um, the phenomena that you're studying. So it says, uh, I'll just read what Kata says here. I got interested in FFT window types when designing my para um, parametric Fourier filter which is supposed to do extreme filtering in frequency domain. The filter seemed to benefit from windowing and four times overlap of FFT frames. My ears were convinced, but why and how does it work? On this page I want to figure that all out in detail. Windows are designed to reduce the problem of spectral leakage. Leakage occurs with every frequency component that is not harmonic with the FFT fundamental. The correlation for such an inharmonic sinusoid will spread over all bins. There is a peak and a base in the spectrum and this sinusoid but the contour can be manipulated by applying one or the other window type. Now that combines computer science uh, with mathematics and a specific application to uh, distortion of signals. Um, Kata produced an YouTube video which is absolutely amazing which is called Precision Matters and it talks about the difference between a 32-bit uh, um, uh, processor and a 64-bit processing and the uh, resolution that you get in your well, basically your sound model um, and this is a very important point about um, even properly uh, properly specified models, um, there are still selection bi biases and motivations which can have a material effect on what your outcomes are. Uh, and this goes to the point of settled science. Um, there really isn't any such thing. That you know, There are questions and there are better questions and there are honed questions. Uh, so um, Anyway, have a read of Catter's work. It really is um, uh, an excellent uh, introduction to and development of getting deeply into the subject. So I got interested in all of this because I'm a guitar player and I, 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 I was very interested in the concept of guitar tone and, and um, I got into the work of... Uh, um, uh, Dr. Pape, Arthur Pape, who produced various uh, uh, work on the um, resonances of different types of wood with guitars. Uh, and um, I would also be very interested in magnetic pickups and, and the piezo effect and, and, and piezo uh, um, pickups. Uh, so I did this video um, which um, compares these things and uses something um, a, a, a spectral analysis um, a, 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 which, which is basically based on FFT and then I got into modeling uh, guitars um, and uh, got into making my own sound models uh, using a process called convolution etc so there's a lot of that on my YouTube channel from a few years back um, and I basically started a thing called Tone Freaks which was and, and designed and started building with uh, something called Arduino and then getting into something called uh, Beagle Black. Um, anyway it, it's, it's uber nerdy stuff uh, but this is a dialogue that I had because um, there are lots of belief systems around guitar tone um, and it's a kind of a non- a contentious thing for other people that don't care about the debate about whether wood makes a difference and it, people get really excited about it as you'll see so um, 
yeah that's uh, that's one to look at but th th that was the foundation and introduction and, and what got me sort of deeply into the mathematics of all of this stuff and the computer science um, so that then brings me to here Hannes Alven is a famous um, plasma physicist also a Swede and um, uh, if you search him these these blogs that come up I'll just read the titles to make the point I want to make free energy the electronic universe social conditioning and conventional pieties conspiracy hypothesis theory crime state crimes against democracy scads conspiracy of context uh, plasma cosmology challenging big bang and scientism in modern physics and climatology Mathematical infinity, elitism and determinism versus free will, mainstream academic scientists, is their clinging to conventional modes of thought, essentially platonic and empirical, and then this is Ruskin's critique of classical political economy. Um, and uh, if you do get the time, it's worth reading into those subjects, whether you read them on this blog or not. And then here is the blog. Um, an interesting story about there was uh, the Carrington event which was a famous uh, storm in space weather which caused the, tr the telegraph to actually operate on free energy from um, uh, uh, for several hours and I, I was fascinated by that story and I did a, a blog on it um, and uh, obviously I, I kept my interest alive in it because in 2017 I actually revisited um, Hannes Alvin's um, Nobel lecture, um, etc., um, and got very interested in the Maxwell equations and this talk by Eric Dollard, who has carried on the work of Nikola Tesla. And Eric, this is a three and a half hour presentation um, on the history and theory of electricity, which is really very, very good. Um, and then this is um, a talk on the electric universe. Um, and uh, if I just click on that here, look. Obviously, my connection is not great. Um, so that is hugely slow. It's he's a guy called uh, the Walt Thornhill, um, and it, a subject of growing interest on the internet. And of much so confusion is because my, my If you've recently there, come to this subject. subject. But I'll put the link in and check it out if, if, if you care to. Looks like my computer's going to crash. That you may have heard more from debunkers than from those truly familiar with the work. That's just the nature of popular science forums on the internet today. In this interview with Australian physicist Wallace Thornhill, we begin the task of correcting the most common misconceptions. Right, okay, so hopefully that will get the stream going a bit better. I didn't get an interruption message. Um, let's just check how we're doing here. Uh, your connection's unstable. Please wait while we try to reconnect you. Um, okay. Well, the connection to the YouTube broadcast doesn't really affect what's actually then... This is also saving to my hard drive as I go, so... Um, I'm wondering what to do about that. I'm just going to plough on because I can always just do this again. It's completely unscripted without notes and uh, these are like my slides for today. So um, I did say in my talk yesterday I'm more than happy to debate publicly any of these, any of these questions uh, scientifically, philosophically, philologically, um, technologically, uh, politically, um, it, it, 
it crosses various fields, all of which I've done a great deal of research and learning on. Um, and, uh, you know, they're important issues that deserve to be uh, discussed. Uh, so there's Wall, there's Eric, and uh, this is um, this famous joke. <laughs> 97% of practicing mediums agree that communication with the dead is real, settled seance. That, that really made me hoot when I saw that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've blogged about some. There's a philosopher called Pigeon who's in um, New Zealand and he wrote a paper actually in blank verse uh, called Complex of Mischief, uh, which is very interesting and it, it responded to criticism of academics uh, that were accused of being conspiracy theorists um, yeah so it's, it's an interesting interesting question right mathematical elitism determinism free will uh, mainstream academic science in their clinging to conventional modes of thought essentially platonic and empirical um, oh so that anyway so these are all aspects around this subject and let's now just uh, have a look at this. This is uh, Jude837 Dude who um, does videos about using Max MSP, which is an object modeling uh, thing for sound. Um, Doctor uh, um, Professor Steve Keane has an object mo modeling software <coughs> called Minsky and that models um, the economy with money in it uh, as money is created. Um, using double entry bookkeeping etc um, and um, uh, yeah, effectively Max MSP and Minsky are very similar um, and use similar algorithms is the point I wanted to make there um, and then what is important then about FFT and this whole point about climate is this this point here uh, the difference between uh, the time domain and the frequency domain uh, tone in music lives in the frequency domain that's that's where it actually comes from um, and uh, things like uh, volume etc um, live in the time domain but so there are linear and non-linear things and then the, in the grain detail when you sort of dig into it uh, you come in with this uh, it's a it's a it's not even just three-dimensional it, it, it's a multi-dimensional um, question and um, FFT analysis spectral analysis um, finite element analysis uh, is able to commute the very complex uh, geometries and trigonometries of these things um, and this is what uh, dude 837 is explaining here altitude of the sound um, oh Crap. <laughs> crap. Uh, what's going on? Allow me to explain. Um, the FFT gives you the amplitude and phase of each frequency, but it gives them to you indirectly. What it actually gives you are what it calls real and imaginary components, but it, you can think of real and imaginary components um, as nothing more than um, the x and y coordinates of a point on a circle. So here's a point on a circle. It has this x coordinate, uh, which is about 10 here, and a y coordinate that's about 8. These are the real and imaginary components of that frequency. It also has a distance from the center. That distance from the center is the amplitude. It also has an angle, this angle here, around the circle. That's its phase. So as I move this point around, what you're seeing are all different points that have approximately the same amplitude but radically different phase. And you can also see that they have very different x and y, very different real and imaginary values. So in other words, what you're really working with are amplitude and phase. You're given real and imaginary because it just happens to be how the FFT is computed. Um, but don't worry about that. What you're really working with is amplitude and phase, real and imaginary. So, I mean, you can watch the whole of that video, which explains it um, in, 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 in a very good detail. It's a very good video, that one. So, moving along, you then come to Cycling 74, which is another um, video. I, I've worked through all of these because I taught myself to use Max MSP, and then I got into using pure data and taught myself how to use that as well. And what um, I really liked about this, you can see I put in Sphere, 
there's um, a video this guy generated uh, called Don't Fear the Spear. Um, and um, all I wanted to do here was actually just show these few frames here. For part two, let's kick off with a basic starter pad. There we are. Um, now we can hold down Alt and click on the grid shape to resize it. 100 and connect that you see to the right inlet here, of our um, geo multiple. That could be the world and then you've got connect all the of these meshes going around it and this the talks matrix. about the, ma the mathematics, the trigonometry and geometry now that make up the spin around that. And connect the um, output there's a, there's of the a better one that shows that, uh, what look like lightning storms and things. Uh, but what this is an idea, it, it shows a conceptual model, okay, and that conceptual mold, model, going back to Quine, becomes a convenient um, posit, a sort of a, a placeholder, um, and that's what climate modelling is. It's not modelling the climate in itself, it's a concept, and a, a, well, it's a model, and that's what the Glassman talk is all about. Um, and then Monkton's paper actually says, well, look, they use feedback theory and they use a particular instance of feedback theory to do with the feedback of um, uh, electricity back into an electric circuit. Um, and they use the maths from that, but they get the maths wrong. Um, and Clay Johnson goes into this as well, where he says that um, climate scientists use um, integration of derivatives in what are essentially ill-posed equations and what that means is that you can't use that technique where you have larger effects from small inputs it only really works for small effects from large inputs and that's not what you have in climate and it's one of the essential and basic mistakes made in the starting assumptions <coughs> of how climate modeling began if you go back now to the uh, controversy that's known as Climate Gate, uh, you'll actually see in the correspondence there, there's um, a person that's asking questions about the models, uh, and, and they use something called Fortran, which is a really old-fashioned um, computing model. Um, and uh, it's basically saying, look, the, the references for this Fortran code the coding itself is naive, uh, but the references no longer exist. And so what we actually have is a mistake with subsequent mistakes building on it. Now, the classic reference to that is when one talks about coordinates and navigating by coordinates. Um, over long distances, a very small difference in bearing will lead to a large mistake and see things being sort of, you know, ships washing up on rocks, etc. Um, and that's what that point is. Um, and that's what the point, Catter's point about windowing um, and how, you know, different, selecting different para parameters and, and cooking up your recipe. You can, uh, you, 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 you get your model to converge upon a repeatable answer. And, and, and the climate models just haven't got there yet. That, that's all the criticism is. Uh, I don't know if I'll find but the part actual two. glow, that was the, the wrong video, but I'm just going to crack on. Um, is this the don't fear the, s don't fear the sphere one? No, this just explains about, about the FFT. Uh, now, so, this point now comes to a point to do with pluralism and convenient posits, etc. And what this is actually, is I did a video called Plurality Still Lies in King Lear, and it talks about context, and it talks about um, degrees of detail. Uh, and, and this jazz guitar harmony lesson is about enharmonic um, chords, and how uh, in the uh, Western music scale, um, where the incidental notes uh, that's the sharps and flats, are named for whether you are ascending or descending. So if you take um, C sharp, it's also called D flat, but it's the same pitch. And that is a very important question because um, 
the vector, i.e. the direction of travel, whether you're travelling up the scale or down the scale, actually causes a different naming. And then the context of that um, pitch within a sentence of notes, if you like, um, actually uh, gives a, a completely different feel. That's what the modes are in music. Um, so uh, it's one of the most profound videos, in my opinion, on YouTube is, is, is this guitar jazz harmony. And the guy is just the most fantastic player to boot. So uh, worth checking out. Uh, what's that one? Let's just renew it and see what it was. Um, this is a video that I did. Um, there was a sign symbols. Uh, uh, there was a conference at MIT, and Noam Chomsky talked, and Professor Ray Winston, who is a uh, basically a professor of artificial intelligence at MIT, and and this looks at uh, concepts and convenient posits, and I. Just at the end of it, I mean, watch it if you want to, but the bit here, which is important, and I found... Mm -hmm. ...circulating around a heavy nucleus at almost inconceivable speeds. In order to explain the principles with which we are concerned in this story, let's assume that we can stop the action within the atom. Now, interesting there, it says no one has ever seen an an atom and this is how we kind of uh, and further perceive it let's acknowledge or don't that this it. is we a symbol of it. representing the atom and not an attempt to show it as it actually is it is impossible to show the correct relative proportions of an atom on this screen for example if an atom could be as large as the united states one of its electrons would be only about 100 feet across Therefore, to tell our story, we must resort to a symbol. Then we can think of the atom as being a group of relatively light, small particles arranged around a heavy nucleus. Hopefully you get the point. I mean, and I say again, hopefully you get the point. Um, then this is the video I made when I was developing the... Uh, my Arduino patch to uh, model sound and how far I got with that. Um, so you can see here all the inputs and outputs and their uh, arrays or uh, different models. So, So you'll see that the diagrams, the uh, notation, um, the modelling techniques that are used in, you know, what my project there was all about, climate modelling, um, modelling turbulent flow in flight, um, they share a common language, a common set of axioms. Uh, but as Klaus points out, they can be misapplied by people who misunderstand the boundary conditions with which um, one should always be cognizant. So then we come to the What's Up With That blog, which is um, a, it's a very popular blog. It, it, it's interesting to read. I, I enjoy reading it. Um, and Lord Monkton is a regular contributor there, um, as is Roy Spencer and various others. Uh, Judith Curry's blog I like. Um, so it's uh, the Battle of the Graphs or whatever. I'll put the links in and you can you can have a look at them. And oh yes, and this is what I mentioned earlier, the Man versus Steen um, court case, uh, which uh, 10 hours ago it appears to be uh, heading to, where was it? There was some modest activity yesterday in the Man versus Steen climate change hockey stick case, which will shortly be entering its eighth year. As that ludicrous fact testifies, it has been procedurally bollocksed by the District of Columbia Courts, which is why it will almost certainly be headed to the Supreme Court. When it gets there, it will be the most consequential free speech case since the New York Times versus Sullivan 55 years ago. 
lest you doubt that, consider yesterday's request by the Reporters' Committee for the Freedom of the Press and various other parties to file an amicus brief on the merits of the case. That's to say, on the danger Michael E. Mann's victory would pose for the right to freedom of speech and of the press. Those supporting our side in this battle include not only the chaps you might expect, such as Fox News, but an awful lot you might not, including NBC, The Washington Post and the ACLU, because they all recognise the threat that man poses to a free society in demanding the courts adjudicate public policy disputes. Um, well, that's a strong point well made. Um, uh, whatever you think of Michael Mann, um, and the hockey stick, um, the hockey stick has been comprehensively debunked. Um, so here we go, Let, let's carry on. Uh, and so we come to the Rocket Science Journal, and um, the point about Jeffrey A. Glassman is in 1970 he published one of the first papers on the fast Fourier transfer and as it's applied to computer science. And um, to say he gets this stuff is, is just to understate. The, the, the brilliance of, of, of this man. I call him the unknown Feynman. I mean, uh, I, it, it, he, he just has one of those minds that one admires. Uh, internet modelling mistake, internal modelling mistakes by IPCC are sufficient to reject its anthropogenic global warming conjecture. <coughs> Albedo regulates climate, not the greenhouse effect. CO2 has no measurable effect on climate. And then he enumerates what he sees as the eight fatal errors. Um, so, I mean, you can read them. I'm not going to read them out. They, they're, they're here. They, 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 they've existed um, since 2009. And there are discussions, comments, and all the rest of it. There's a, a kind of a dialogue between Glassman and, 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 and Schmidt. Uh, Schmidt is the guy that took over from Hansen. Um, at NASA on climate and all that particular department of it and um, you know I have to say that, that um, for me uh, if I were to select someone to put into bat on the arguments I would select Jeffrey A. Glassman PhD every time over Gavin Schmidt if you look at the IQ squared debate um, I, Gavin um, I'm sure he's a brilliant mathematician and a brilliant physicist, um, but I, I think his objectivity um, f has been tainted by from a political perspective, which is a, which is a shame, because you know he, he seems like I'd go and have a beer with the guy. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I uh, th these are scientific questions. Um, <coughs> I mean, for goodness' sake, it's not worth losing your hair over. Um, right, so next, this came up today, and I, I wanted to put this into this talk. I, I'm, I'm a poet, and, and realistic poetry. Um, I've, I've sort of been looking at that side; they, they change it all the time. But, but anyway, this, this came up, and it's the ghetto physicist, and uh, this is his poem about the picture of this rose. And uh, um, I'm going to read it: the eroded marble crumbles. And the statues of kings fall within the marsh of the shadows of silence. There is a clearing among the shades drawn by the curtains of the emerald forest. To the poet, without words, to tell her prince. Petals of crimson marmalade is her sonnet. That's beautiful. Made my day that did. I enjoyed reading that this morning and I, I duly retweeted it. And so now we come to the great song Woodstock. Um, I posted the Joni Mitchell version of it earlier, um, although I do prefer the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young version. Uh, but Joni wrote it. She was going out with um, uh, one of them at the time, um, and uh, you know she, she's a great songwriter. Um, there's another song of hers. Uh, oh, what's it called? It's about war and things like that, and, and all the things that are really sort of constant flies in the ointment. Um, it, it was referred to on the slog, um, and uh, actually, actually, I did do a blog on it. I'm not going to pass over this point because I do want to, to make it. So, 
Let's just uh, have a look to see. Uh, Jamie Mitchell. Let's see what comes up. Um, mentioned recently in the blog, I know. Um, oh, nothing. Uh, have I spelled it wrong? Nope. Uh, right, okay. I, I'll put that in afterwards to find it. I don't want to break up the stream here. Uh, so that's the court case. That's Glassman, more Glassman, the Rose, Woodstock, uh, what's this one? Oh right, that's Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young's uh, version of Woodstock, which is brilliant. And then we come to Jonathan Cook's blog, and he's talking about uh, Thomas Kuhn and a change in paradigm. It's actually an article about why the press, or, or the Guardian in particular, really doesn't like Jeremy Corbyn in the UK. Um, and uh, another one of my mentors, uh, the great uh, Roy Madron, has this super competent democracies blog. He, he's written a book which is wonderful, um, and I'm not sure it's got a publisher yet. I'm hoping to talk to Roy and get him to publish it on uh, my new Web3 project, um, which I'm going to just say something about in a minute. Uh, but um, here we are super smart democracies will emerge as the people, their liberating leaders and their technical professionals learn how to use ensembles of participatory, cybernetic and soft systems processes to co-create increasingly just, sustainable and super smart communities, organisations, enterprises, cities and states. Now, Roy does uh, believe in the um, AGW climate change theories, or he did last time we made a video series together about super smart democracies, and, and Roy has told me off in the past for being a denier. Um, well, I'm an unashamed skeptic, and I'm I'm not a denier. I'm an agnostic. Uh, there is a difference, um, uh, but to me, the direction of travel seems to be away from the AGW hypothesis. But I absolutely do say there is an environmental crisis, which is why my children are on strike as well, um, out in sympathy with Greta Thunberg. Um, and what we're doing is talking about the details. Um, so uh, anyway, that's that's Roy. Um, and then we come to uh, this next thing here. Um, this is a bit of fun I've been having with my co-cooperative um, founders for this thing. And I, 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 the Nobel Prize for falsification of scientific paradigms. We award these gongs to our laureates who shall be known as cunts. A paradigm shift typically occurred, Kuhn argued, when a new generation of scholars and researchers exposed to the rival theory felt sufficiently frustrated by this inertia and reached sufficiently senior posts that they could launch an assault on the old theory. At that point, the proponents of the traditional theory faced a crisis. The scientific establishment could resist, often aggressively, but at some point the fortifications protecting the old theory would crumble and collapse. Then, suddenly, almost everyone would switch to the new theory, treating the old theory as if it were some relic of the Dark Ages. The founding collective of cunts will host the first nobbled prize dinner in Stockholm, where our new uncensored journal, The Objective Cunt Review, will be launched. Um, so I'm doing part two of my talk live on YouTube this morning, so now, then I will be writing an essay on parts one and two. I will then program the cunt journal portal, which will take me several weeks. Um, good morning, hope we can conference at some point. Um, so that's that. Uh, there's a page, and then we're just going to finish with this. Ah, ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Good night. My next guest, as Johnny Rotten, is the leader of the Sex Pistols. He's currently the lead singer for Public Image Limited. He's just written a book about the Sex Pistols called 
rotten. No Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Please welcome John Lydon.